Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for all coming tonight. Um, I'm personally really excited about the speaker we have. Um, you don't often get to share the same stage as someone from NASA. So uh, it's a pretty special, pretty special day for us all who've been organizing this. So actually, just to give a bit of background, this is the first event in a new public lecture series, Oxford Sparks Live, that is trying to really showcase the research that is happening within the university to non-academics, to people who are outside of the university a lot of money that we, we get for our research is coming from taxpayers' money, so we feel it's an obligation to show you the sort of stuff that's going on. Um, but we also want to try and bring in some really inspirational figures, people who can inspire the next generation of engineers and scientists, and you don't get that much more inspirational than NASA. So when we had the opportunity to invite Dr. Shin here, it was such a great thing to, to have. So I, um, I want to say a couple of things, first of all, that. If there is a fire alarm, then we just have to follow the green signs uh, out, so exits there, 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 and there. Um, if you have any questions during the, the talk, what we're going to do is we'll have a roaming mic, but also you can tweet your questions. Just have the hashtag Sparks Live. So at the end of the talk, we'll have some opportunity for, uh, for questions. Uh, so this is also going out on Facebook Live. So if anyone's watching this, I uh, just want to say hello and welcome to, to Oxford. So, for our speaker, I, I had this written down on purpose so I don't forget because it's quite an illustrious career. First thing I'd say is that NASA stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So notice the aeronautics in that. And that's really, Dr. Chin's responsibility is for aeronautics. So that's a huge part of NASA's remit, but maybe for a lot of people you don't appreciate that NASA's more than just space. So uh, Dr. Shin is the Associate Administrator for Aeronautics. So it's basically covering all the strategic and research aims based on aeronautics for NASA. Before his career started in Korea, uh, doing his bachelor's there, then he did uh, a master's at California State at Long Beach in the US, and then went on to do a doctorate in mechanical engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Uh, so uh, prior to being at NASA head headquarters, so there's a I don't know how many centers you might say, but there's a lot of different NASA centers. Uh, he was running one of them, the Aeronautic Project at NASA Glenn Research Center. Um, between four, uh, 2004 and 2008, he was a deputy associate administrator for the aeronautics at NASA uh, HQ. And he's won numerous uh, prestigious NASA awards, so NASA's Outstanding Leadership Medal. These are really coveted things. If you see anybody work at NASA, they have this on their desk as a badge of you know, honor. So it's great that he's won so many. Uh, he also has done a um, graduate of the Senior Executive Fellowship Program at Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And not only that, he's also published around 20 journal papers in high-speed research uh, and ICE. So I hope you'll all give a warm welcome to Dr. Shin for what I'm hoping will be an amazing talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. I was actually uh, watching the video that Neil put up there, and that looks uh, actually better presentation than mine. <laughs> <laughs> we may be able to just uh, keep watching that. But um, uh, I, I really sincerely uh, want to thank the Department of uh, uh, Engineering Science for inviting me. Uh, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to be here uh, and spending next hour with you. Um, I, NASA, has, well, NASA and NACA, the uh, predecessor of uh, NASA, uh, NASA was founded um, in 1958, but NACA uh, was established back in 1917. So uh, we, uh, 1915, uh, sorry. So we celebrated 100 years of anniversary a couple of years ago. And uh, we thought uh, we were old, 100 years. But uh, we're just even uh, not a kid, we're a baby around here. <laughs> that 100 years doesn't mean anything <laughs> in this town. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it, it's just tremendous uh, to be in this environment. Um, and uh, we probably, NASA probably cannot even compare all the contributions uh, this university and the community 
has made to the humankind for the next, I mean, last uh, uh, almost uh, 900 years. Uh, but I, I'd like to share some uh, of uh, contributions that NASA Aeronautics has made uh, for the past 100 years. Um, and then uh, very briefly, and then I want to actually share uh, next hour or so with you uh, where uh, the aviation can go uh, uh, or might uh, head out. Uh, so I, I, it's great to see a lot of uh, uh, young uh, people here uh, because uh, a lot, hello, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great to see uh, all of you. And um, because a lot of things that I'm going to talk about uh, today, uh, this evening, uh, uh, will be actually uh, the, the work that you guys will be doing. Um, and so I'm, I'm just very grateful that uh, many of you showed up. So th uh, there's a reason why I, I set the uh, dawn of a uh, new era uh, for aviation. Uh, it's because I think we, if, if you happen to be uh, in this field, uh, this will be really most exciting time uh, since the introduction of uh, jet age. And so again, uh, we'll, we'll share some thoughts uh, why I, I say this and I have chosen this as a title. Uh, aeronautics, NASA aeronautics for the past 100 years or so, uh, again, compared to contributions uh, this community has made, it's probably very minuscule, but uh, we have uh, certainly contributed uh, at the very early days, uh, just basic understanding of flight. Uh, flying is, is a totally unnatural act, right? <laughs> Who has uh, wings uh, that I cannot see here that you guys can fly? <laughs> so we are not supposed to fly. And um, that, that very unnatural uh, act uh, has been possible uh, through many people's uh, uh, blood and sweat and uh, hard work. And um, NASA also broke uh, sound barrier and um, also brought in uh, jet engines. And uh, very uh, recently, uh, but it's not even uh, very recent anymore, but uh, some um, 10 years ago, we uh, set the world uh, Guinness record for uh, uh, speed. Uh, using the air breathing hypersonic uh, vehicle, uh, we flew uh, Mach uh, 9.7. So, uh, you know, the, uh, some of my technical people told me that uh, how hard to ignite the uh, engine at that speed is like uh, trying to light the candle with a match uh, in a hurricane wind. <laughs> So, so imagine that. So uh, we uh, accomplished that and demonstrated in real actual flight. So, so like I said, uh, minuscule contributions, but I think we have made a little bit of a contribution to the world of aviation that we all uh, enjoy now. So this is a little after 100 years. Uh, this is where we are. Um, all that little yellow things are actual revenue generating commercial flights. We, we didn't include any GA, any other types. These are all airline carriers uh, over uh, uh, airspace uh, over the uh, United States. So uh, you can see the Eastern Daylight Time uh, on the lower right hand corner. So it's, it's getting into uh, wee hours. And uh, you can at the very top in the middle number of flying, that's the number of uh, airplanes at any moment. So just now, uh, East Coast is waking up. Uh, it's a six uh, in the morning, so uh, very quickly, whole East Coast is filled up with airplanes. And just about now, the lazy uh, West Coast people are waking up. <laughs> so so uh, at the peak hour, uh, there are over 5,000 uh, uh, commercial uh, airliners, uh, it's well over 5,000. So um, if you think about that, uh, and compared to any other uh, transportation mode, you may say uh, sky is vast, so what's the big deal about 5,000 airplanes in the air, 
Um, where the big deal is, sorry, need to drink a little bit. Uh, big deal is uh, you have to you have to fly, see the uh, uh, kind of, you can draw up maybe highway in the sky, right? So the, the main reason why you are flying is you want to go from one place to the next place or your destination in the fastest and most direct way, uh, barring the weather problem. So nobody wants to go to uh, LA to New York uh, and coming down all the way to Mexico and then and fly north up. No one wants to do that and no one wants to uh, leave uh, Los Angeles and arrive in New York City at 3 in the morning, right? <laughs> so <laughs> almost all flights want to get in the same pipe and uh, about the same time. That, that's the first problem. Second problem is they all have to land. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can just park somewhere <laughs> in the air and wait for your turn. You have to all land in uh, the most busiest uh, airports in the U.S., uh, Atlanta, uh, doesn't have uh, uh, 10 runways. They mostly operate uh, two, three runways simultaneously. That, that's even great uh, airport. So you have to all queue up and land. So that's the big deal. It's a highly complex integrated uh, system. And so what, what has brought this amazingly complex system uh, into reality. There have been, as I said, there have been so many uh, breakthroughs in technology and, and many, many thousands, tens of thousands, uh, probably millions of people have worked uh, in various aspects of this aviation. But I'm going to just single out only two uh, seminal technologies. One is a jet engine, as you see there. Uh, before jet engines introduction, airplanes used uh, uh, piston engines, right, and, and uh, propellers. Uh, totally unreliable. So you show up at the airport, uh, uh, you just totally uh, depend on the fate of the aircraft and health of the aircraft. So uh, nowadays, if, you, if your flight gets canceled, uh, what do you do? <laughs> You, you run toward the customer service and demand why the flight is canceled or delayed, right? Back then, it was normal. I mean, you show up and if you're lucky, you fly. Um, and, and then another problem is you, you, can, you couldn't fathom going across uh, ocean uh, because range wasn't there. So uh, with jet engine, uh, the, the whole system became very reliable and uh, you, uh, started thinking about actually flying across the ocean. So oceanic flight was uh, possible and reliability uh, was possible because of those things. Uh, and then planes, of course, got bigger. So a lot more passengers can be uh, packed in. Uh, we all love uh, uh, to be sitting in uh, Airbus 380 with uh, 600 closest friends now, right? <laughs> like a sardine can. Uh, but back then, that was a revolution. Um, 150 people uh, packed in one aircraft. Uh, so because of the high load, load factor, airlines started uh, uh, making money and actually be able to uh, lower the airfare. So that's a, that's a big uh, breakthrough. Another one was a swept wing. Um, propeller airplanes couldn't fly fast enough that requires uh, more efficient wing design so that if you look at the propeller airplanes, they, they mostly have straight wings. Uh, and until the swept wing was introduced, uh, airplanes couldn't reach uh, near uh, Mach number one. Uh, we call that kind of transonic uh, speed, right? So uh, with, with that high speed, uh, now the flying time has been uh, shortened, uh, reduced and again, reliable, and uh, uh, more people can fly uh, in one uh, flight. So uh, airfare started coming down. So again, there, there were a lot of other technologies, but uh, if I want to pick only two uh, uh, seminal technologies or uh, te technological breakthroughs, I would say uh, jet engines and swept wings. So it's not just 
uh, convenient and you can go long uh, range, but it is the most uh, uh, safest, it's the safest transportation mode combining everything else, <laughs> ground, maritime, and all that. Um, so how safe is that? Uh, this is just uh, US statistics, so you can read that. Uh, it, this, this just doesn't do justice. It, the, the safety doesn't come like this arithmetic way, right? <laughs> but um, how many of you think that, hey, I'm stepping in this uh, uh, metal tube and I have not met these two pilots. I have no idea what kind of crazy people they are. <laughs> <laughs> So how many of you stepping in the aircraft and thinking that and say, oh, I better turn around and because I, I don't want to leave my life uh, in, in the hands of these total strangers. How many of you think that way? Oh, yes, few people, <laughs> very prudent people. <laughs> but most of, us, most of us don't think about that, right? You step in and enjoy your flight. Uh, how did we become like that? <laughs> We take it for granted. Uh, it wasn't always like that. Flying was highly risky business. Um, so that's why most of us choose uh, flying for long distance travel. And if you look back and you know, look at the pictures from our 30s and 40s, uh, these people trying to get on the airplane look like they are going really fancy parties. That they dressed up like like crazy, and uh, they're just getting on the airplane, <laughs> but they dressed up like that, because it was for only uh, rich and famous who have the adventurous minds that I may actually get killed <laughs> flying this, but I want to try that. Uh, if you go to the airport, uh, especially any U.S. airports, uh, you be, you'll be lucky uh, if you run into people with a decent uh, uh, pants and, and you know, t-shirts, right? Uh, many of them come in pajamas uh, <laughs> to fly. So uh, th this has just become everyday transportation. Uh, nobody thinks about, I, I run into several uh, European colleagues who actually commute from uh, 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 continent of Europe to London. On, on EasyJet or uh, Ryanair or those air, uh, discount airlines. So it, it has changed. The point I'm trying to make is it's not just travel or transportation. It has changed our lifestyle completely. That's what uh, air tra travel is doing. Uh, take a look at this one. This is uh, currently the longest direct flight from uh, New Zealand to uh, Qatar. 18 hours, 20 minutes. <laughs> How would you like <laughs> to be in that airplane? <laughs> but look at, look at uh, what poor, poor uh, flight attendants had to do. <laughs> 1,000 meals <laughs> served and over 1,100 uh, cups of tea or coffee. Gosh, those, those flight attendants earned their money <laughs> for that flight. But could you imagine um, if you, if you uh, lived during 1950s, could you imagine this was possible? It would be possible at some, some point in, in the future. This is the current aviation. And aviation is not matured industry uh, because we take it such a for a granted way. Uh, some may think, well, you know, there's no, no innovation, there's nothing, uh, to, nothing new there. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just almost natural as just walking. So some people actually think that way. And uh, some people on US Congress think that way. So I often get a question when I have to explain our budget uh, to our members of Congress or staffers. Some people uh, actually ask me, isn't aviation 
sunset industry. <laughs> so far from it, because if you look at this, this is uh, uh, from many, many different sources. Um, so it's, a, it's an amalgamation of uh, many different credible sources. So this is not NASA made up uh, data at all. And uh, between uh, where we are in time now, uh, for next maybe uh, uh, 20 years, uh, air travel, uh, no matter how you look at it, or no matter what uh, you talk about, uh, number of passengers or uh, trip uh, uh, miles or number of trips will be doubled. So, uh, and the composition of the uh, travelers will be vastly different. That uh, so far traditionally, major uh, growth has been uh, across Atlantic, right? Uh, between uh, US or North America uh, and, and Europe. But it, it's shifting to Asia Pacific region and Middle East. So, it, so in, in this uh, way to show da data here, uh, if you look at just China and US uh, for comparison, the yellow portion of this bar uh, is where we are standing now. Uh, certainly US has way more uh, passengers than China today, but that blue portion of the bar is what the, what the growth will be uh, between now and year 2035. And, and US growth is slowing down by comparison to China. And uh, all these other countries, India, tremendous growth, Indonesia and Vietnam, those are the top five uh, growing uh, countries in aviation uh, for the next 20 years. But if you add more countries, you will see many more um, non-North America and European uh, countries. So all in all, uh, industry thinks that uh, the whole uh, global aviation market will need more than 36,000 uh, new airplanes, whether to replace the uh, aging aircraft or completely adding uh, new capacity. That's hardware only. That's about four to five trillion dollars. If you ask me, right, uh, how many zeros are in trillion dollar to me? I don't know how many zeros there. <laughs> but I know it, it's a lot of money, <laughs> four to five trillion dollars. And then by the time you sell uh, that hardware, then you, you sell parts, right? And you, you uh, sell service. So that's another four to five trillion dollars. So we are truly talking about eight to ten trillion dollars market next 20 years or so. So it's not just uh, UK, it's not just US seeing this data. Whole bunch of other countries are seeing this same data. So heat is on. That's why uh, Canada, uh, Bombardier just put out this amazingly fantastic aircraft uh, called C-Series. This is little smaller than Airbus 320 and Boeing 737, which are the workhorse uh, golden geese of all the airliners. But um, they, are, they are nipping at their butts. Uh, so th this is, a, again, fantastically superb aircraft. Uh, China is rolling out uh, direct competition to 737 class. Uh, Russia is into game uh, with MC-21. So again, like I said, heat is on, but I would say competition is good, right? Competition uh, makes everybody uh, stay sharp and everybody trying to uh, up the game. So one of the things that, that, that is happening uh, in aviation industry, just like any other industrial sectors, is getting tremendous benefit from this digital revolution, or uh, some people call it digital uh, transformation. So it's all things uh, about turning analog world to digital world. So all this additive manufacturing, internet of things, you know, all these new technologies that you see on that list, 
could not, could not have been possible if digital world didn't exist. So because of that, digital transformation of revolution, all these new technologies are coming in, and that makes uh, all the airplane business smarter. So uh, airplanes will become smarter, and uh, manufacturing will become smarter, and uh, also maintenance will become uh, smarter as well. This is the state of the art. Uh, I'm from the US, so <laughs> I beg your indulgence that I'm, I'm putting up uh, Boeing 787, but uh, I think Airbus would even agree this is the state of the art uh, at the moment. Um, a lot of innovations. Um, this highly efficient composite wings, this is all composite. And most of this fuselage is composite, not aluminum and it uses one megawatt of electricity. And look at the size of the uh, nacelle. So a lot of innovations. Uh, if you just look at the outer uh, mold line, it, look, it looks like 707, <laughs> right? But uh, inside the skin, there, there have been a lot of innovations going into that. So since 2011, this is, I don't know how Boeing tracks this kind of data. <laughs> but I don't think they made it up. Um, 18 billion pounds of fuel saved. Just godly amount of uh, fuel. So that's why airlines like that. Um, but if you look at the same 787, if you look at the size of the uh, uh, nacelle, engine nacelle, it's 9.25 feet. And I'm a short guy, so even the tall guy like uh, that figure in that six foot will have still <laughs> quite a bit of uh, uh, room uh, to hit the top of the nacelle. And in fact, that whole engine nacelle is only uh, like less than one meter in diameter narrower than 737 fuselage. So think about that. <laughs> so if, if we enlarge that nacelle any bigger, two problems will happen. It's going to start scratching the ground, <laughs> right? And uh, it, it's so huge that it's going to generate too much drag uh, and negating all the uh, uh, aerodynamic efficiency and fuel savings that the high bypass ratio engine brings. So we can't make this nacelle any larger. <laughs> So uh, the point here is, although 787 is state of the art, uh, it's hitting uh, actually physical limit of that, uh, what we call tube and wing configuration. So uh, the, all the innovations from um, the digital revolution that I earlier talked about will help uh, certainly this tube and wing configuration, but NASA Aeronautics has been working on uh, this kind of uh, concept. That this, this is not a flying wing. Uh, the difference uh, between flying wing and this blended wing body is flying wing is, is really, the, it's just whole wing, right? It, it, the whole airframe is a wings. But this one has actually fuselage, that fat part in the middle. But uh, fuselage is kind of blended into the wings. So aerodynamically, uh, much uh, more efficient than tube and wing. But then um, look at this, this uh, real estate here. You, you don't have to mount engines under the wings. So you can actually, you can actually bring uh, even higher bypass ratio engines. And also this um, surface, fuselage, will shield, act, act as a shield to uh, uh, prevent the noise uh, coming from the uh, engine hit, hitting the ground. So it's, it's a kind of fooling the <coughs> physics, right? <laughs> we can't change the physics, but uh, if you stand next to this airplane, uh, it'll, it'll come across as much, much quieter engine because you're not going to you not get that uh, uh, acoustic signature. So there, there are a lot, a lot more uh, features going into this, but when you combine all the light 
materials and uh, new structures and high bypass ratio engines and uh, highly efficient aerodynamic. Um, our systems analysis shows that uh, this type of uh, new concept uh, configuration can save uh, up to 40 to 50 percent of fuel consumption. So it's a tremendously attractive. Um, so we've been doing a lot of uh, ground testing and uh, we did uh, flight testing. So uh, some of the young folks here, uh, I, I really hope uh, when you actually start flying uh, for business or pleasure uh, in 20 years or so, uh, I hope you will fly in this kind of airplane. How about uh, electrification of aircraft? So you, you are all familiar with uh, uh, Prius, I think. Uh, that's number one uh, hybrid uh, automobile uh, in the whole world. I, I think they just sold a gazillion uh, uh, units of Prius. It's a similar idea that uh, for even the uh, large transport category, if, if we have two gas turbine, conventional gas turbine engines here, and that gas turbine engine will generate power to drive uh, electric motor and uh, the fan uh, here. So it's a combination of gas turbine engines and electric motor driven uh, fans to bring up the efficiency. So um, up until only three or four years ago, if someone talked about this kind of concept, they would say you are either crazy or you, are, you, are, uh, you need to be in Hollywood to make a sci-fi uh, movies. But now we are serious. We're getting serious uh, because, because technologies are coming together. The batteries coming together and um, all the electric uh, power management system, those concepts and technologies are coming together. So engine companies are very, very uh, excited about the possibility of bringing this kind of technology. In fact, this may actually come online faster than the blended wing body concept that I showed you. Because this is still tube and wing, right? So uh, it doesn't affect the ground infrastructure that much. It still has gas turbine engines. So uh, I think this may actually work out into our lives earlier than uh, uh, non-tube and wing configuration. Now, Next video that I'm going to show, I, keep, I need to give you a warning that especially young, young uh, kids, uh, it, the sound may startle you, but uh, here goes. So that's what we call sonic boom, right? The pressure shock when the airplane uh, breaks the sound uh, barrier. It, it, it transcended down to ground. And that you, you saw people cheering, I, it, it just briefly. And they were watching these fighter airplanes flying by and, and generating this sonic boom. And like guy like me, airplane junkie, uh, this is music to me. <laughs> <laughs> but to most of normal people, <laughs> this would be total nuisance. And uh, it actually, depending on the situation, it may actually do some structural damage to the buildings. Uh, certainly can break the window, uh, depending on, again, the situation. So it's a, it's a highly annoying thing. Um, so that's why, um, certainly in the US, uh, there is a complete ban. It, this is not a provision or anything, complete ban of a, a commercial supersonic flight over land because of this kind of annoyance. In the international arena, um, ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, body of UN, uh, that sets up all the uh, standards and regulations for aviation, uh, has a similar rule. Uh, they didn't ban, but it's, it's effectively the same rule that they said uh, no annoyed, annoyable or uh, harmful uh, sonic boom should be generated from uh, uh, commercial airplanes. So that's why 
for the longest time uh, since we broke uh, sound barrier, there has not been uh, real viable commercial airplanes. You may say, well, British Airways and uh, Air France had conquered. So what are you talking about? Uh, it was an engineering marvel. Uh, we all love that. I mean, I, I drool over that airplane whenever I go to Air and Space Museum. But it was a dirty airplane, <laughs> right? It, it was a gas guzzler. Uh, emitting a, a pollution like crazy. And when it tried, tries to land, uh, as an example at JFK, air traffic managers, uh, traffic controllers said, get the heck out of everybody. <laughs> everybody, get the heck out of airway. We got to land this airplane immediately because it, it's such a dirty, noisy airplane. Engineering marvel, never made any time uh, flying that. So what we are trying to do is, in NASA, learning from that experience, let, let's not put the engineering power first and figure out how society will accept, <laughs> or in this case, wouldn't accept. Because, uh, because of that problem, uh, I think there were only like 12 Concord were in operation, and very limited city pairs, only coastal cities. Um, so we have been working on, um, by design, not any gimmick, uh, uh, gimmicky things, but by design, can we actually reduce the intensity of this sonic boom? So this is the uh, Lockheed Martin concept uh, that we are trying to build actual demonstrator, flight demonstrator, with a pilot in, in this cockpit, I'm sorry, in this cockpit. Um, Notice the long slender wing. Um, so that will actually form a very uh, weak uh, sound, uh, sharp waves. So when they come, start coming down to ground, they do not coalesce uh, to become a major shock waves. So that, that's, the, that's the by design, nothing, nothing gimmicky here. <laughs> so uh, we are trying to build that airplane and start flying uh, in uh, 2021 and then uh, demonstrate that low boom is possible and we're going we're gonna to ask people to react to that. And so rather than that, that frightening and very annoying uh, loud noise to perhaps uh, you know, kind of thunder in summer night and in far away. Uh, so if you really look for it, uh, uh, and you may hear it, or it just varies in the background noise. So if that is possible, then uh, we will be able to affect the regulatory agency to re-examine the current rule. And then if there is a money to be had, uh, industry will jump in. So NASA is just trying to show that, that this low boom is feasible and uh, let industry decide. So I, I talked about some of the large transport category, uh, the commercial airlines, uh, uh, new technologies, or where we are heading out in the next uh, 20 year, years or so. But there's another, uh, uh, oh, sorry, there's a, one chart uh, to summarize what I've been saying. So trend, you see the trend there, uh, that big uh, hub and uh, uh, spoke system is, is not quite working well. So uh, point to point uh, is what people demand. And then uh, ultra efficient supersonic hybrid electric propulsion and the reduced crew cockpit. So now we have uh, two pilots in the cockpit. Can we actually, I, I, before I say it, I gotta look at your facial expressions. <laughs> can, can we actually have one pilot <laughs> in the cockpit? Uh, it, it, it may be very difficult to accept, but technology is there, right? I, I, uh, I was in a jumper seat um, some years ago um, from uh, Fort Lauderdale in Florida to JFK. And not, not to frighten you, the pilot never flew the airplane. <laughs> it took off automatic. Whole time it flew by itself, it landed automatic. So, we are already doing it. Um, so that may be 
uh, coming to our lives as well. Um, but there are a lot of challenges too. So in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to move on. So I, I talked about large transport category uh, development and, and then trend. But then all of a sudden, we got this uh, what's called unmanned or uh, inhibited uh, uh, air vehicles, right, UAS. If I want to be politically correct, I don't want to use unmanned. <laughs> but uh, there's no one in there, no one <laughs> in the uh, uh, airplane. So it, it flies by itself. Uh, they, currently, there, there is a ground pilot. It's not a fully autonomous, of course. So remotely piloted uh, air vehicle. So some seven years ago, when we started uh, UAS integration into uh, airspace project, we all thought about a very high capable, highly capable uh, large UAS like uh, Global Hawks uh, that uh, military uses. How do we bring that back in our uh, civil uh, UAS, uh, uh, national airspace? That's what we were working on uh, past uh, six, seven years. But then, all of a sudden, this thing came along. How many of you own this? Uh, something like this. Good. <laughs> Our uh, young, young folks uh, have some of those. If you, look at, if you look at this, what made this new uh, invention possible? What do you think? It's another, another brainchild of a digital transformation, digital revolution. If it didn't have the communication technology, GPS, and it didn't have the battery, compact battery, all those things, this would not have been possible, right? From aerodynamic perspective, it's not really a big deal. Um, if you have a decent um, uh, aeronautics background, you can design this and start flying down. But what, what's enabling this is really, again, all digital technologies. So all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> this interesting invention start coming into our lives about three, four years ago. And uh, the Federal Aviation Administration in the US, which is equivalent to CAA here, uh, forecast in, in short three years, by 2020, there could be 7 million as many as 7 million uh, small UAS in the US. You think that's a little far-fetched? That's, yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of uh, <laughs> small UAS. Uh, as, of, as of last month, uh, FAA mandates uh, these small uh, UAS owners to register uh, their vehicles. So as of last month, uh, the number passed 1 million in the US. So you, we all know the human nature, right? If there were legal, legal uh, abiding, law abiding uh, good citizens, 1 million of them, there are probably two more millions <laughs> <laughs> uh, who are not registering their units. So even if you discount it by 50%, uh, three, four million drones are huge. Remember how many new uh, large transport category airplanes will be needed in the next 20 years? 36,000, right? And uh, today, there is about 25,000 uh, uh, commercial airliners in the whole world. <laughs> so this, this is just, this is different game. Um, so how do you, <laughs> And they, uh, they want to fly at low altitude, below 500 feet. So that airspace has not been controlled because th there have been nothing flying around other than birds and occasionally helicopters, emergency uh, for rescue and search and stuff like that. But there have been nothing man-made objects flying in that airspace, that's why it, it has been regulated, but it has not been controlled. So we have to come up with new control air traffic management system to accommodate this. Um, that's why 
NASA has been working on the past uh, three years to develop new air traffic management concept and the system for, they, they need to be able to sense and avoid, and uh, we need to put sort of uh, rules of the road uh, kind of a, a setup so it doesn't stray. And if, if it's a uh, kind of agricultural applications, you just need to put uh, uh, geofencing like that. And then you just don't allow uh, these drones fly into a highly secured area like airports. But people are <laughs> flying these things <laughs> into these areas uh, as we are speaking. And uh, in the US, a lot of wild, wild uh, fire uh, happens, right, in the US. Um, there have been several reported cases that whole operation had to stop because some idiot was trying to fly this drone into that wildlife, I mean wildfire area and try to take a, a picture. So imagine this thing hits either the helicopter blades or uh, sucked into a jet engine. Uh, it will create a catastrophic disaster. So this, this is becoming golden opportunity for uh, aviation, but also a big headache. Do you notice what this, what this is? Great, you, get, you, guys, you guys picked it up right away. I didn't. <laughs> I, I visited Niagara Falls several times, but when I saw this picture first time is, wow, that's amazing, that's fantastic, where is it? <laughs> because it, it just gives very different perspective, right? Um, we hear a lot about this uh, Amazon and Google and Facebook, all these companies wanting to deliver pizza to you and uh, coffee and all that. <laughs> so uh, Amazon actually uh, is, is uh, no, not Amazon, uh, uh, Facebook is actually trying this and also. But uh, this is a, a Mercedes-Benz concept, package delivery. So you, you see these uh, small drones up here. Uh, so last mile, they, they call it, last mile will be uh, delivered uh, by uh, drones. So, I'll let you watch this. You probably have seen some of these videos. Um, they're not doing this to make money. <laughs> Uh, Intel executives told me, please don't say that. <laughs> they are not doing this to make money. But think about all those uh, drones, every one of them, in uh, trying to uh, develop the swarm uh, control uh, algorithm and, and how to maneuver these uh, drones. And this is, a, this is a big business. So they're just using this as an application and uh, they have been asked world, uh, uh, worldwide, around the world, to put these light shows. So uh, it's, a, it's a good commercial for Intel as well. But uh, what they're doing is amazing. Uh, it's just one example. But like, like people are saying, sky is the limit, really, pun intended here. Y you think about the application, this drone can do it. So that's why I'm saying uh, this is really exciting for people like uh, me and, and people in the aeronautics or aviation industry. But we thought that was, the, that was the new era of aviation, but there's something else is coming. <laughs> so <laughs> you know where, where this is? This is Sao Paulo, Brazil. As far as you can see, <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you see there? <laughs> The traffic jam, I've never been to Sao Paulo, uh, fortunately, but uh, people who had been there told me the traffic jam is, is horrendous and you could get stuck in any one of these traffic jam for hours. So uh, there is a company uh, called uh, Voom, uh, V-O-O-M, actually providing helicopter service uh, for about 20 minute uh, ride in helicopter from uh, your wherever the pickup point to the airport, uh, that they charge about $150. Not bad, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I might use that, it, rather than being stuck in there <laughs> for hours. It, it's working in Sao Paulo because the problem is so acute and local government doesn't have any other solutions, but it's not gonna work in London and I surely don't think it's gonna work in Oxford. <laughs> and many, many uh, developed country uh, metropolitan areas that will not happen because of this. It's noisy. <laughs> that's, that's why helicopter operations in uh, major population centers all pretty much banned other than emergency uh, helicopters. Because of that infrequent operation, um, there is a service in Manhattan as an example, but how many how many of you can actually afford that from uh, uh, Manhattan to any one of the three major airports that they have, JFK, LaGuardia, uh, and uh, uh, Newark? $2,000. I certainly don't think I can pay for that <laughs> for eight minute ride. So this is not the solution. If you if you have been in, uh, like, like Neil, <laughs> who had been at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, from San Francisco to San Jose, uh, it's, it's meager 48 miles. But uh, it could take anywhere between hour and a half and two hours, depending on the, the hours. What if, uh, what if we can fly? So that traffic jam I just talked about in Sao Paulo is not unique to Sao Paulo, right? Um, I live just outside uh, Washington DC in Northern Virginia. So from door to door to my office, it's 19 miles. And it takes whole full hour <laughs> to, to get to my office. So it's everywhere, it's every, Metropolitan areas, this traffic jam is horrendous and it's going to get worse. Sorry for the bad news. <laughs> so the demand is certainly out there. So uh, with the convergence of technologies, I'll show you several uh, concepts just very quickly. Convergence of uh, vertical lift and electric uh, motor technologies and precision navigation and communication and, and ability to process data, all these things are coming together, just like the small drone was possible. People start working on, these are all, not, I shouldn't say all, many legitimate companies and many more startup companies. Um, this is Airbus, actually, Airbus uh, concept. This is a German startup called uh, Lilium. So they, they are, whole bunch of concepts like this, but there are a lot of uh, uh, organizations working on this, hoping that they will open up this business. So air taxi business, and Uber actually announced last year that they will start demonstration flights in uh, uh, Dubai and uh, Dallas. And I think they recently picked another city in the US, but they're, they're serious. Uh, we have been talking with Uber, so this is not a uh, marketing gimmick. So it, is, is this future gonna come? What do you think? I, I show uh, very quickly trends and challenges. There are a lot of, of uh, non-technical challenges. Safety standards, uh, we have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea what should be the safety standards because this cannot be the uh, same as large transport ca uh, uh, category, which has 10 to the minus nine safety standard. Uh, this community will not be able to match that. But it, it, you, cannot, you cannot be comforted by hearing that, right? We are not going to be as, as good as large transport category, but we are a heck of a lot of better, better than ground transportation. <laughs> Would you be comfortable <laughs> to get on air taxi 
when uh, they advertise that way. So this is a big challenge. And noise uh, and people may get frightened just seeing these things flying around over, head, over their heads. So uh, it's not, uh, oops, sorry. I blew my uh, fun slide. <laughs> It's not just uh, uh, noise, but visual barriers as well. And cyber security, big, big uh, challenge. Uh, if somebody hacked uh, this thing, uh, you know the consequence. Um, so I'm not saying this is easy, but this time two things are happening. One, technologies are there and they are converging. So. If you ask any technical people in aviation, they would say it's feasible over time, not, not tomorrow or not next year, but over time it's feasible. A lot of deep pockets are investing. Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're all working on this. Airbus, Boeing, uh, everybody is betting on this future, so deep pockets Legitimate companies are working on it. So this is not your grandfather's flying car. <laughs> and I, I hate that term, flying car. <laughs> this is not a flying car. This is a dedicated uh, air vehicle that can carry fully autonomous and vertically take off and land quietly uh, in the future. So um, I blew, blew uh, my slide here, but... Um, what do you see there? Certainly, we see uh, Captain Kirk there. <laughs> what is he holding in his hand? They call it a uh, communicator back then, right? This was uh, back in, so young folks probably don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, when you go home, uh, use a source of all knowledge, Google search. Uh, type in uh, a Star Trek, and uh, this kind of image will pop up. This was enormously uh, uh, successful and uh, uh, fun TV program back in late 1960s. So think about the 1960s. Yeah, and and this guy is holding what looks awfully like flip phone, right? <laughs> this is what we are using now. Forget about flip phone, <laughs> we're using smartphone. So some 40, 50 years ago, people had desire that wouldn't it be wonderful <laughs> if I can have a device and just call anybody and talk to anybody, wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, it is wonderful and, and it happened. So there's a strong, as I said, demand uh, in the people. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I can just fly from uh, on demand when I want from uh, San Francisco to San Jose in 20 minutes? Wouldn't that be wonderful? So what's the difference between the producer of Star Trek uh, back in 1966 imagining that and today we're enjoying it and if we all think, start, let's start think, let's all think, we want this air taxi <laughs> and personal air vehicle, then I think uh, it, it could happen. So what's the benefit? Uh, just like the air travel changed our lifestyle altogether. It wasn't just transportation mode, but our lifestyle was completely changed. This new possibility will change our lifestyle altogether yet again. So that's why I'm saying new era of uh, aviation is dawning. The city of uh, San Francisco has uh, roughly 47 square miles, but the, the length of the streets in that city is well over 1,000 uh, miles. So if you convert that to surface area, this is, this is Golden Gate Park, which is huge, huge park, right, in San Francisco. So that streets are taking up 
about six times uh, larger surface areas in the city just for moving cars. <laughs> so if we can save 20% of the surface areas and reduce the number of cars by opening up the sky over our heads, how wonderful could that be? This is, this is why for the last umpty years, people, eccentric people or normal people, crazy people, all those people worked on flying cars because they want to open up that world. All failed because digital revolution hadn't come. But now we have digital revolution and all the other technologies coming together. And I, I believe this time is real. It's, it's over time, I, I emphasize that, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but over time, I think this is real. So if we do that, as I said, the future, especially the young folks here, you will be living in very different city setting, very different lifestyle, and a lot of surface areas we can reclaim for something else, a lot more greenery, a lot more parks, a lot more schools. So wouldn't that be wonderful? So I know I went over quite a bit, <laughs> apologize. Um, so I, I hope uh, you, you stay a little bit longer and uh, we can exchange some uh, ideas through Q&A. So I apologize for going over probably like 25 minutes. <laughs> But I, I, I really enjoyed uh, uh, sharing some of the things that NASA is working on, and we are working on all of this. Um, and let's, let's all think that this future can come. So just like that communicator from Star Trek, uh, 20 years later, this, this actually is normal in our lives. Thanks so much. Thank you.